Hi everyone, this is Nuclear Pep Talk and I'm Senia Bernowska, your local guide into a nuclear world. Nuclear Pep Talk is a platform where I ask 10 questions to break myths and fears about everything nuclear, hopefully in simple terms and with a remarkable expert. And in our fifth episode, we are going to discuss a topic that is really dear to my heart and this is going to be a nuclear ban treaty. Before I introduce you our guest today, I would like to show you something really interesting that I found on the internet and it's called Nuke Map. Here you can model a nuclear explosion anywhere in the world with any kind of weapon. So for example, I live in Vienna. So here there is no Vienna, let's type it in. Um, so I live in Vienna, let's go to Vienna. And I live really nearby the city center, so somewhere here. Let's say that someone decides to explode the nuclear weapon somewhere around my house. And let's pick a bomb which is close to a Hiroshima bomb, which was a 15 kiloton. Very small one, relatively small compared to those nuclear weapons that you can see now in nuclear weapon states arsenals. So, as you may see, these are, these are the circles that represent different kinds of damage that might happen to the people, buildings and everything around the ground zero. So, you see that little circle that is yellow? This is called fireball radius. This is where basically everything gets evaporated. Um, the green circle rep is called radiation radius. It's where basically most um, most of the life um, will get the radiation dose that high, that high that it can be fatal. And those who will not die right away might die in one month or get a cancer afterwards. Um, this. I think this one is a moderate blast damage radius and the red one is a heavy blast damage radius. It's where heavy buildings, heavy concrete buildings are going to be severely damaged or even demolished. Uh, and this is I'm showing you the Hiroshima bomb modeling, which is super small compared to those weapons that our nuclear weapon states have in their arsenals nowadays. So if we look at the, you know, for example, at the bomb that is like a Castle Bravo test, which was the largest US bomb tested, which was 15 megaton, the damage will be much, much bigger. So here we're not talking just about Vienna being hurted, but we're talking about the half of Austria being hurted. And today our special guest is Florian Eblenkamp, who is a campaign officer for the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN. He supports ICANN work to promote it uh, among parliamentarians and civil society, and he makes sure that ICANN gets support also within the nuclear umbrella states, you know, those states that don't really have nuclear weapons, don't or don't have control over nuclear weapons, but still kind of benefit from them. Um, so that's a kind of interesting and very exciting job to do. <laughs> um, before before working for ICANN, he worked for the European Commission's uh, Humanitarian Aid Service and he also holds a degree in public policy from King's College London. In his free time, free time, he's getting a political and data, political and data science master's degree uh, from Zurich University. We were thinking about a particular nickname we can come up with for Florian and with what he has come up with, I think, is a flow no nukes. So Florian will share with us what is nuclear ban treaty, why we should ban nuclear weapons, uh, why is it even a, a sensible solution, and uh, he will also share his experience in working uh, for ICANN and campaigning for nuclear ban treaty and nuclear ban in general. So please welcome. So hi Florian, thanks for being today with the Nuclear Pep Talk. And without further ado, first question to you. Tell us, what is Nuclear Ban Treaty? What is TPNW? So TPNW stands for Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's a treaty of the United Nations um, that prohibits the use, the development, the test, the possession of nuclear weapons. Um, even the threatening of using nuclear weapons, so it's very comprehensive. And it's sort of the representation of a ban of nuclear weapon in international law. 
And one thing I really like about it is that it takes into account the humanitarian suffering that is caused by nuclear weapons and takes that as a starting point in order to produce international law. So it's, it's a security contract, if you wish, but it's also very much based in humanitarian law. Can you tell us how can a nuclear weapons ban be actually verified? Because I think that sounds like a very difficult problem and challenge. Yeah, you're right. That's super tricky. And it's very tricky with other weapons as well. I think of chemical weapons, for example, you can't, I don't think you can be a hundred percent sure ever that they, that they don't exist. But, um, as far as the, the treaty is concerned, article three talks about safeguards, for example. Um, and it establishes the safeguards of previous treaties as the minimum requirement for all the member states. And for most of the states, that's the, the, the non-proliferation treaty, the NPT, um, where most of the states have signed this additional protocol um, that allows the IAEA, for example, access to their nuclear sites and so on. So um, there is a mechanism how you can verify it, not to 100% probably, but as well as with other treaties um, the TPNW can also verify. And also the, the TPNW um, will create um, a competent international authority, the CIA, that is then maybe tasked to do this verification job. So there will be an institution that supervises the verification. Hmm. I didn't know that actually. That's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it going to be an international institution or like based in like United Nations or what is it going to be? Um, it's not clear yet. That's, uh, I think firstly, it will be like more of a scientific advisory body. Um, mm -hmm. they will actually talk about it at the conference next week. Um, and then gradually maybe it be can become a, a bigger institution, um, funded by the member states, um, and eventually maybe funded by the UN themselves. Yeah. But I mean, that's okay. just speculation for me. <laughs> uh, Florian, can you tell us about the historical background of how TPNW emerged? Because I know that there is a big, there has been a long history um, before we actually got to that nuclear ban treaty stage. Um, so can you give a little bit of a historical overview? Yeah. So traditionally, nuclear weapons and in international law are governed by treaties that. Uh, are a pr product of the Cold War usually. So they date in the 60s or 70s, such as, for example, the NPT. Um, and it's not really up to date anymore. Like the world has changed so much, including the, the nuclear weapons world. Um, and additionally, of course, the NPT also enshrines the obligation for nuclear weapons states to completely disarm their arsenals, right? They just never did it. Um, and therefore the, the NPT kind of became a, a justification, I would, I'm tempted to say, for nuclear weapon states to keep having their nuclear weapons. And that, of course, built a lot of frustration amongst the states that don't have nuclear weapons because they always or almost always um, attended to their side of the contract to not have nuclear weapons. Um, and then in 2014, I think the first humanitarian conference um, was uh, actually conducted also in Vienna by the Austrian government to highlight uh, the humanitarian struggles that are involved with, with the use of nuclear weapon. Um, and then it became a gradual process from there. So later the UN adopted a resolution to establish a working group and then that working group uh, recommended to start negotiations. The negotiations finally started in 2017. In a very short time, I think it was only a total of four weeks that the treaty was negotiated. And then the TPNW was adopted on July 7th, 2017, and entered into force in January 2021 after 50 countries ratified it. And I think by now we have 62 ratifications in total. So it's already, already grown since then. Today's opportunity break is going to be a little bit short because I just don't want to take a lot of your time. And today's going to be two opportunities. The first one is Hiroshima ICANN Academy. And this is a wonderful program. I actually want to apply myself. This is where you learn about humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons use. You do online modules together with other participants, you know, young professionals. And you also get an opportunity to go to Hiroshima. 
I mean, hopefully, if the, if the COVID doesn't change the situation, but I guess the ideal, the, the, the ideal situation is where you actually go to Hiroshima for several days and, you know, get to see, get to see it for yourself. And I think that's already worth applying. <laughs> And the second opportunity I want to mention today is VCDME internship. I'm finishing my internship on 31st of August, so VCDME is waiting for their new intern. And I really urge you to apply because I encourage you to apply. Because this is the one of the greatest opportunities you might have in this field. So please make sure you check out the link and try and apply. Because that might change your life forever. I don't mean to be dramatic, but it's just really cool internship. Do it. You know, a nuclear event treaty sounds like a dream treaty, you know, for us young yeah. generation who, you know, are against nuclear weapons and we would like to live in a world that is more peaceful, which means, you know, lack of like the, not lack, but the absence of nuclear weapons. Um, what are the challenges to nuclear ban treaty? Um, so at the moment, of course, everyone's talking about the war in Ukraine. That's certainly a very big challenge because, uh, yeah, Russia has threatened other countries to maybe use nuclear weapons. Um, and that kind of made people on the one side aware that nuclear weapons still exist and that they are still a problem. But at the same time, it has started discussions about using nuclear weapons for deterrence as some sort of protection for a country, like very absurd arguments, in my opinion. Um, but in that sense, nuclear weapons are back on the surface um, in a way that um, probably nobody expected it to be. And that, of course, is a, it, it's a challenge to a disarmament treaty. Um, the other big challenge that I see is the, the irresponsible behavior by nuclear weapon states. Um, actually, all of them modernize their arsenals, um, mm -hmm. developing new kinds of weapons that are easier to use, maybe, or um, you know, um, investing billions, literally, into into their arsenals, into airplanes to carry those weapons, into uh, rockets to, to uh, launch nuclear weapons and so on. So um, a bit below the surface of the public attention, there's an arms race slowly starting and evolving and uh, increasing in speed. Even. So um, while one part of the world, the, the countries that have joined the treaty, um, really advanced disarmament, there's other countries who act in opposition of that and even modernize their, their arsenals. You know, you've, you've been talking about how they modernize arsenals because most of nuclear weapon states consider nuclear weapons as the crucial component of their national security and, well, and therefore international security as well uh, and stability. What would you say to the nuclear weapon state? Why should they give up their nukes? So I know this might sound a bit like a dream, but if everyone gave up nuclear weapons, everyone is safer, including the nuclear weapon states. So um, usually this is, is um, something that people overlook, like um, you're only as safe as you can sort of out nuke another country. So um, as long as you, as long as someone else has nuclear weapons, nobody can be safe, to put it the other way. Um, at the same time, of course, a UN treaty is the most legit multilateral process that you can imagine. So it's not a treaty that would force one country specifically to disarm and give up all their military or like all their protection that they think they have. But it's a, a process that's international and verified and um, very integrative, brings all countries on board. So um, if you want to disarm, then probably the smartest choice is to do it through such a process. Also, nuclear weapons cost insane amounts. Um, just last week, I can publish the report that uh, spending has actually gone up by 10% in 2021. Um, money that could, of course, easily be used for other challenges, climate change or healthcare or social services or you name it. Um, and fundamentally, of course, countries and governments have a humanitarian responsibility. There's, there's really no way you can use a nuclear weapon without uh, committing a war crime and uh, violating international humanitarian law, because you will always kill uh, invariant uh, civilians and soldiers alike. So, um, yeah, if you really want to stick to humanitarian law, <laughs> give up your nuclear weapons. 
that's a good motto. <laughs> <laughs> We should we should probably promote that more in diplomatic and political arenas. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely. that's what politicians should hear and say much more often. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is ICANN and what is being done to promote nuclear ban treaty? And maybe can you give us some success stories of promotion of nuclear ban treaty? Okay, so ICANN is the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. It's a civil society organization. I'd like to, to look at it as a network of NGOs um, globally also, like I think it's a more, in more than 100 countries, about 700 NGOs or so that team up in order to promote this treaty. We have a small, a small team that, that's uh, working for ICANN and the sole mission of ICANN is to promote the ban treaty. Um, Success story, I mean, there's many success stories, of course. Uh, something that always makes me extremely proud is when I can manage to give voice to people who suffered from nuclear weapons. They so often get overlooked. Um, and I think one of my proudest moments was when, um, when Sitsuku Thurlow, she's a Hibakusha, so someone who survived the nuclear attack on Hiroshima, um, gave uh, a speech at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony telling the world about her, her life and her struggles. Um, so that's a, a fundamental value of ICANN, I think, to give voice to those who, who are often overheard. And of course, the big success story is the TPNW. Like, um, it's now a fully functioning UN treaty. 62 countries have ratified it already. More are likely to come already next week. Um, Slowly, slowly, that uh, international law norm is, is building up and um, yeah, there's, there's more countries joining and therefore less countries that could ever develop nuclear weapons. I think that's, that's, uh, that's a good success story. And why do you think, you know, we, here we talk about politicians, diplomats, think tankers, civil society. So these are stakeholders that are more so involved in that, you know, nuclear topic that is so far-fetched for many people. What would you say to those people who are actually not involved in the field, why it is important for general public to prohibit nuclear weapons? So I can understand if not everybody wants to get involved, firstly, maybe, because there's so many challenges and also dealing with nuclear weapons can be quite overwhelming at times. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really a risk for everyone. Nobody can, can sort of hide from a nuclear weapon. Um, which also accounts for the for the sheer fact that no healthcare system in the world could ever be prepared to to care for the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Like all the hospitals would just also be wiped out, all the communications infrastructure, and so on. So, um, just looking at the suffering, I think there's a strong argument why everybody should care about nuclear disarmament. So Florian, during the, our coffee break, can you tell us how did you get involved? Because that's really interesting. So, um, I don't know if there's a, that's a typical story for, for people who work in this armament, but I, I studied international relations in my bachelor, um, mm -hmm. a bit focusing on security politics, um, found it very interesting to think about these concepts. Um, and then wanted to work in that area and really quickly realized that um, it's usually old men wearing gray suits that sit on stages and talk about their view of the world. And then that's somehow considered correct or impactful. Um, and I was really annoyed by that. Like um, I really thought this can't be real that just because someone's old and wearing a suit and a man, they get authority. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, for example, they would completely ignore the fact that people have died from nuclear weapons or that, um, I mean, it was not only about nuclear weapons at that point, of course, but many different aspects, you know. Um, and then, yeah, eventually I, I heard about ICANN and the, the TPW really found it a cool um, idea, I'm tempted to say, to influence international law through civil society. And also just a bold move to come up with a, a nuclear ban treaty just to get rid of nuclear weapons altogether. Um, something that I could, could easily support from my values. And then, yeah, slowly I, I got contacts in that area and became a volunteer with ICANN in Germany at some point. And then 
it slowly uh, started building up from there. And here I am giving a talk about it. So. <laughs> I guess the moral of the story is that if you really share these values, you can always start with like volunteering for organizations like that. And then, you know, start a career like Florian did. Yeah. Do get involved. It's, it's really, it's your choice. What is the first meeting of state parties of the TPNW and why is it important? Why is that historical? Um, yeah, so the meeting of states parties of the TPW is a conference that's taking place in June in Vienna, 21st to 23rd of June. Um, and it's the first time that the member states of the treaty come together to discuss how the treaty can be implemented. Right, so the treaty is relatively young. It's so far basically a, a text um, that countries have signed. But it has to be, kind of be uh, addressed that how, for example, you want to verify nuclear disarmament or how do you want to um, conduct environmental remediation in, in areas that are, are poisoned from nuclear tests or um, how do you want to um, hear the testimonies of, of Hibakusha people, for example. Um, so in that sense, it's very historic because for the very first time, um, countries come together to discuss how they want to implement the ban of nuclear weapons and um, implementing that treaty, of course, will set the tone for nuclear disarmament over the coming decades. So I think that meeting is, is really very special and something nobody who's, who's somehow involved in nuclear disarmament should miss. It, yeah, it's, it's literally open to everyone. There will also be a live stream online of, of some sessions. So even if you can't come to Vienna, um, yeah, make sure that you watch uh, MSP TV and Get, get involved from there. Yeah. You know, before we go into the last question, um, I have one question that, you know, is very dear to my heart because I do research in that sphere, in, in that field. So you already mentioned that TPNW has this very special thing, which is a uh, humanitarian impact and how, you know, how humanitarian impact of use of nuclear weapons has been addressed. So can you tell me, how does TPNW address the humanitarian consequences of use of nuclear weapons um, and why is that important? So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's one of the defining features of the, the treaty and also what sets it apart from, from other treaties on, on nuclear disarmament so far. There's the Article 6 in the TPNW that talks about victim assistance and environmental remediation. And that's literally what, what it's about. So you assist the victims of nuclear weapons use and test um, through, through different means. And um, state parties are also uh, obliged to start cleaning up the mess caused by nuclear weapons. So for example, there's you know, areas that are just uninhabitable because a nuclear weapon was tested there. Um, and now somehow um, it's, it's up to those countries uh, to clean it up. Um, so that it's not actually the people suffering there. In that sense, the treaty, first of all, acknowledges that there is human suffering involved um, when you test nuclear weapons and of course, when you use them. So one example is that I expect that the countries that attend the conference next week um, will agree to set up a fund where all of them pay mm -hmm. some money um, that can then be used to help those who suffered from the test or use of nuclear weapons um, for example, by providing healthcare, um, by, uh, you know, just um, caring for their family. There will be an instrument, a fund that can be used for that, which is revolutionary in that field. And I think it's also important to mention that before the sufferings have never really been addressed in the nuclear weapons treaty. So that's also why it's really important because DPNW yeah, is, I guess, it usually um, nuclear weapon states chicken out and don't really mention even the fact that people suffered. And that leads us to the last question. So, um, you know, a lot of people can watch us and say, well, you know, we don't do research in that sphere. We don't really work on nuclear disarmament, but I feel like the same as in the climate change, each of us somehow can contribute to it. How it, like, like a regular person who is not dealing with nuclear disarmament on a daily basis can actually help to make nuclear weapons ban treaty reality and how this person can get involved? Unlike climate change, nuclear weapons, the problem of nuclear weapons can be solved relatively easily because it's up to a few people that make political decisions about them, right? So 
if we somehow manage to influence those decisions, um, actually, we can advance and clear this armament quite a bit. So um, it's really, it's probably really easy to get involved. If you just talk to a politician about nuclear weapons, then that's already the first step. You don't need to be super knowledgeable to do that. You probably know more than most politicians do about it anyway. So um, don't be afraid to do that. Um, if you don't want to talk to a politician, which I can understand, it's sometimes annoying. Um, all of you have, have a bank account somewhere. Maybe talk to your bank if they uh, invest into companies that produce nuclear weapons, which is also prohibited under the TPW. Um, and if they do so, ask them to change that policy and uh, tell them that there's actually international law that they are violating. So um, that's maybe a small step. And of course, if you want to do something uh, really easy, take out your phone, follow ICANN on social media, um, get updates, um, and join us at a point that's more convenient for you. Florian, thank you for being with Nuclear Pep Talk today. I'm sure many people got inspired uh, with Nuclear Ban Treaty, and you know we'll follow MSP next week and ICANN work in the future. And um, uh, you can now have a chance to say something to our audience before we finish. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tinya, first of all. It's really cool to be part of this. I have a last message for those who are really now uh, afraid of nuclear weapons because it's, it's become an urgent topic now. Um, I know this sounds very overwhelming, all the, all the news that you hear, um, but on the positive side, um, we have the TPW, and a way to look at this is that the ban is the plan for disarmament. And remember, fear is here. Learn about nuclear. Thank you for being with us. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please press the like button, subscribe if you'd like to see more. I know that a lot of you watch and don't subscribe and I know that's a normal thing on YouTube, but I feel a little bit sad about it. So please, please subscribe just to stay tuned and always be aware of a new nuclear pep talk that just come, came up. I don't know. And today's acronym of the day is obviously TBNW. I know we've talked a lot about that during the video, but for those who didn't watch the video and will watch only nuclear ac acronym of the, of the day, uh, here it is, Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I know it might sound utopian, um, stupid, weird to someone, but I think it sounds bold and very sensible. This is a treaty that, this is one and only treaty that is legally binding and prohibits nuclear weapons and also addresses the humanitarian consequences of the use or testing of nuclear weapons. That makes it a remarkable uh, piece of uh, legal artistry, I might say. So this treaty entered into force in 2021, very recently, 62, like 60 plus states already have ratified the treaty and it has be, it, it's on its way to become a universal norm against nuclear weapons. Very much needed, and I understand that we live in a world where there are many threats, and um, the security environment right now is not the best, it's just the worst, I might say. But I think in these trying times, in the conflict times, that's when we actually need to pursue the disarmament path not to make it worse, but at least to strive towards a, a more peaceful coexistence.